I'm so happy to have Miranda Newman back with us. She is one of our favorite speakers every year, and she's going to be talking about cybersecurity in today's environment. Miranda, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'd like to start off with what are some of the most prevalent issues that you're seeing in your practice regarding cybersecurity? Thank you, Bernice. Thank you for having me. Um, I think some of the biggest things we've been seeing in recent um, trends is all related to privacy, data security, um, data breach. And that's kind of a international and national level concern. There's a lot of um, new policies and procedures and, and dialogue generally. Uh, 23 states have policies that they're in, dis in discussions about um, on the privacy uh, data security realm. Obviously, the California Consumer Protection Act is a huge one. It's the first um, all, uh, sorry. Okay, you wanna take that one from the top? Yeah, okay. I'm trying to, let me figure out the word I want. Yep. Okay, no worries, we've got plenty of time. Yeah, and I need to mute my phone. I don't know if that came through. That kind of threw me off with the phone. I no, I, I didn't hear it. So whatever your uh, background noise mic or whatever you're doing works really well because I didn't hear a peep. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So where where should I start? So, so I'll just pick it up. Okay. In fact, what I'll do is probably just lead off again. Um, I'm delighted to have Miranda Newman with us again this year. She is one of her most popular speakers because she talks on something that's a real issue for the entire industry, uh, and that's data security. Um, I screwed it up, see? <laughs> I had the intro, I had the intro right the first time. <laughs> well, you still have it recorded, so you can go back I still to have that it one. recorded. Let's try it one more time. Let me kind of make a flow here. I'm so happy to welcome Miranda Newman. She's one of our favorite speakers and she is an expert on cybersecurity. Miranda, I'm so happy to have you with us today. So let's start by asking, what are some of the most prevalent issues that you're seeing right now in terms of what's happened with COVID-19 as well as just in our general practice in terms of cybersecurity? Yes, um, and thank you for having me. Um, I think generally speaking, uh, just on a kind of a global and, inter and national scale, the most prevalent issues right now revolve around data privacy, data security, data breach. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion and dialogue and uh, legislation in various states throughout the country. Um, the most recent is the California Consumer Protection Act, which is the most comprehensive um, in the United States today. Um, and it's very privacy focused and data breach focused. And um, I bring that up because I think with these other states, at least 23 of them have um, legislation that is being proposed or discussed or at some various state. Some other states are in this wait and see pattern. Um, but this all began back in 2018 and became effective in 2020. So it's a trend that's been around for a long time. And then with COVID and co the impact it has had on businesses and the changes people have to make in their daily business operations, that whole um, philosophy of privacy and data security and data breach have, are more in the forefront of people's minds, even while they were prevalent before, it's even more so now. So I think um, to answer your question, while those are sort of the background issues that I've, I've seen historically, um, there are also some of the questions I get in relation to how do we manage our business operations in this current environment with people remote, working remotely and those kind of things. Um, a lot of the initial questions are just the, the fundamentals of how do we do it? And then you get to, well, okay, now that we're, how do we do this securely? And that's where the data privacy, data security, and cybersecurity, and that, those kind of things come into play. So for those people who are struggling with this, and what you said uh, before we uh, began the session today, I thought was very interesting, that the people who had already set up to have data security and, and cybersecurity in place for their agents, um, you know, to be able to 
work, you know, with their, you know, use their own devices so I can plug in with my Mac or whatever my particular computer of choice is into the company system. They're doing fairly well with the remote work, you know, working from home. But those who did not have that in place are struggling. And if there's anyone who's sitting in the audience, what kinds of steps do they need to be taking to get to the point where they can have a better level of data security for their businesses? Yes. Um, those companies that had that in place, it was just one less thing they had to do, you know, with setting up remotely. The things first you have to understand, and most business owners are, but you want to understand what kind of data you're collecting, especially the sensitive data. Um, what kind of information you're collecting on your clients and, uh, you know, prospective clients and all of that. How are you storing that information? How long are you retaining those records? Um, your particular state law is going to be come into play there because there's different requirements. In some instances, not all states have, have something out there, but some industries also will have uh, data retention, data destruction policies. And all of that, while it often sounds like it's just in relation to paper documents or just in relation to um, uh, online data, oftentimes they're, it, it's interchangeable. It, data is data, whether it's in a electronic form or written form. So once you've under, understand what it is your, what kind of data you have and how you're storing it, then you can write the policies um, around when you want to destroy it, who has access to it, um, company training, you know, employee training. It, it's kind of a multi-layered approach and it's going to be dependent on, you know, how many folks you have in your office and what roles they play in that office. Um, and then, you know, in the COVID world that we are in today on a remote um, perspective, it's just applying that to that remote workstation, wherever that person may be. Um, the bring your own device is, if you had that in place in your office where somebody could work off, they could connect to your internal network using their phone or some other mobile device, the corollary would be them connecting with their laptop or some other device back into your network from a remote station. Um, some people are working in the cloud, so that might not uh, translate as well, but if you have a local server and people are remotely logging into that server, then that you should have secure protocols in place for what that looks like, password protection, secure VPN, and of course, you know, all the software and security updates and all of that on your, on your local machine. Um, and those as well would have policies in place so that the, the remote workstation would likewise be secure. Uh, are there any platforms that you've seen that, you know, kind of, I know you're in the midst of making a change with your, with your law firm, what, you know, what, what, how are you changing and what are you changing to? I'm switching to a cloud burst, excuse me, cloud-based server um, for my internet provider. And that's offering a whole suite of Office 365, which comes with Teams and um, all the Office products that come with that, as well as the, um, the security protocol, there's a, the security protocol that's inherent with my internet uh, service provider, but it's a business package. So it's a little bit more robust um, and it has built in redundancy. I have to maintain records for up to 10 years, seven to 10 years. So I need that redundancy in the event that um, there is some catastrophic failure or, you know, just an inadvertent deletion of a file that I need to recover that was deleted today that I needed to recover from, you know, three days ago or something. Uh, so that's, it's a process. It, it takes a lot. You have to work a lot with your service provider to identify the parameters that you need. And for me, a server is pretty basic. All we work with is essentially, I just need a file server. So I'm not working with any um, large uh, images or recordings or anything like that. But they built it to, to, your, to your specific needs and they, you know, they, it's an enterprise-based system. What's also good about that is you, you know, when you're working with any vendor, whether it be, you know, something on this level of, of, of a server, you want to vet the vendor, make sure they're a reputable vendor, want make sure the contract provisions are in place that ensure that they are on the hook for all those data security um, requirements and that if there is a failure, they will indemnify you for any of those losses. It's obviously, it's hopefully that never happens, but, um, 
it is one way to a offset some of the liability that you might have to maintain in house of protecting all that data and managing it yourself. But also from a business owner's perspective, it takes that off your list of to do's of maintaining that server in house, you know, and making sure the software updates are there. And um, there's in, in my case, this all happened because my server was just outdated and I needed to update it. And rather than replace the in-house server, this provides an option to me that takes quite a, quite a bit of responsibility from my day to day um, and passes it to a third party that can then manage that for me. So, And just as an aside, back up, back up, back up, you know, have two backup drives, have a backup system that's independent of whatever platform you are on. And also back up to external drives. So I just went through this, uh, you know, with an issue I had where I had to replace a brand new MacBook Pro after about six weeks. So never yes. expecting to have that kind of problem, but it does. So yeah, that's the system I have in place now. I have an in-house server and I have a cloud backup and I have a local backup. Um, and then I have a historic local backup. So I do a snapshot every like three months. That's yeah. Three yeah, or four so four systems. And when, you know, uh, you know, especially anybody who's running a brokerage or if you're doing any kind of, you know, transfer of funds, you need to have those records, you know, absolutely. And it's, it's important too, because from a data breach perspective, if there is a data breach, then you as the data controller have to notify all of your clients and all of your customers that you lost their personal information. And that, while, I mean, that's a huge reputational damage. That's why I kind of started off with a, a full idea of privacy. Consumers are very cognizant of their privacy now. And we're in a different, we're in a different phase. Whereas before, when people first started in the internet, nobody really cared. They weren't really aware of how much information was being collected about them. And now that they're becoming more aware of what data is out there and what's being collected and how it's being used, it, by extension, they're more concerned with what are you doing with my information and how are you protecting me with my information? So as a business owner, if you can be aware and sensitive to that, you're going to garner trust with your clients and hopefully avoid that circumstance where you have to call them and say, hey, I, I lost your bank information or, you know, all your all those email addresses went out and now your clients are being spammed. So it could be something very harmful or it could be something maybe not so harmful, just annoying. But at the same time, that's not the kind of kind of conversation or notice you want to present to your your client. You know, one of the things and I, I know there's not really a solution for this particular problem, but I hate it when I see somebody has spoofed my email address and they're sending stuff from my domain, it looks like, and it's not coming from our domain, obviously. And I wish there was some way to catch up with these people, but I guess there's a not. <laughs> From what, you know, Not yet, the but it is a huge problem. I think that I, I recently learned the word uh, typo squatting, and it applies to that kind of thing that you're talking about, where it's a URL or an email address or something that looks very similar. Like when you read it, it looks correct until you look closely and then you realize there's just one letter off or one number off or something, or it's a .net instead of a .com or something that doesn't register right away as being incorrect. And so people, the recipient thinks it's from a safe sender and it's not a safe sender. Um, sometimes it's just spam. That's a lot of the uh, phishing scams get through that way. Wire fraud transfers are initiated with those kind of spoofing addresses. Um, so what the, the good thing to be aware of is what I almost always do on a, I, with my Mac, um, if you float over the email address, it'll show you what the full email addresses and so you can read it very carefully. Um, so I just make a habit of always reading anything in the recipient line. And if there's any of a doubt, I just delete it. But um, that's just a matter of training yourself to always check those things. And then by extension, training your agents and training the people that work with you to, to know to look for those things and to look for those things. You know, one of the things I've done, and this is kind of a little perverse delight thing, but <laughs> um, <laughs> When I, I see the, you know, I, when I get one of those things that is clearly spam and it, you know, or phishing and you look at the address on it and Mac, uh, Apple at least has this on the preferences where you can actually 
tell it what to do and you can send, you know, you can, you can block those. You can take that particular, I like getting the .com. I've gotten rid of .ru and a whole bunch of other ones where stuff originates. And I'll yeah. put down an amount of your spam over and above that. Uh, so um, let's get to one of the biggest issues that we have in the industry, which is wire fraud. What are your recommendations for, you know, we have a lot of brokers sitting in the audience, a lot of people do, that do have, whether we're selling products or services, this is also an issue if we're wiring money anywhere. Um, what, how can we protect ourselves? Well, first you start with information. So I, was, I always recommend at the beginning of the transaction, um, or even before the beginning of the transaction, just when the offer has been made and accepted, and you know who the party to the transaction are, make sure that everybody there also knows who those people are. So just have a list of names and phone numbers. Um, be suspicious of any wire transfer instruction changes. Uh, do everything via phone. It doesn't have to be done necessarily at the time of the transmittal, but the person that's sending the funds, that's wiring the funds should call the recipient and confirm those, uh, those transfer instructions to make sure that they are correct. And the reason I say they should make initiate that call is because you know you have a verifiable number. You don't want to have an unsolicited phone call come because you can't identify, you can't verify their identity. So you want to be the one initiating that phone call. And oftentimes, once you've transferred funds, the bank, your bank will tell you that the funds were transferred. They won't necessarily know that they were correct or incorrect. They'll just tell you that it, it was successful. So you want to contact the recipient and ensure that the recipient receives those funds. Um, because if you can, if it was in, uh, misdirected, then the sooner you catch it, the more likely you are to be able to, free, uh, recover your money if it's gone the wrong direction. Also, if, if you, if you've been a victim, if it did happen, you want to contact the FBI, you want to contact your local police, um, you want to contact the financial institutions, you want to contact your insurance provider. Now, they might not be able to do anything in regard to the wire transfer itself, but there may be some corollary issues that your insurance provider maybe need to be notified of or be available to help there. So the, the biggest things is just communicate and, and make sure that everybody has the relevant information and just know, be suspicious of any changes and, and pick up the phone and call somebody. So in the transaction, you know, who takes responsibility for that? If I'm at an escrow or title company and the funds are being wired from the lender to the title company, is that, a, you know, is that obligation on the lender or is it on me as the agent or the broker who's responsible for, for handling that? It depends. It's a very specific situation. Um, I've seen it where the attorney involved in attorney states was responsible. I've seen it where the financial institution was responsible. If it was a title company that was hacked, there might be some responsibility there. Um, if the agent gave the wrong information or the incorrect information, the agent could be responsible. So it's very fact specific. And I can tell you this, if there's a large sum of money involved, um, and it does go to litigation, they're going to bring in absolutely everybody. So um, that's, well, maybe not in all cases, but typically that's what they do. They bring in as many parties as they can. So um, yeah, it would be pretty fact specific. So, uh, you know, I guess the, I, this goes back to having systems in place. And if you're a bro you know, if you're a broker, if you're in leadership, you know, making sure that you, you know, that you have those policies set for your agents. Now, um, just some journal tips for agents. I think we've talked about email, but just kind of reiterate again, what are some of the things that they can do to make sure that they don't fall for phishing scams or other kinds of things? Uh, just maybe to reiterate some of those and any other ones that you have for us, Miranda. Well, um, just make sure, one of the easiest things is keeping your email and your software up to date. They are always updating those to try to catch as many as of the different scams as they can. And your mail server is going to do the same thing. They, they get better, but they can't catch them all because the hackers are, are faster than, than the software. But so always make sure that that's up to date. Um, it's good to try to stay informed and just see what's out there. There's always some new thing that's coming up. Um, for email addresses, if you don't recognize the email address, don't open it. Um, if you get an email from a, a, uh, an address that you do recognize, but it doesn't look right, 
either don't open it or call the person if you know them or send them a separate email and, then, and let them know I received this email, did you send it? Um, because once you click on something in the email, that's when you're gonna have a Trojan horse or a virus or some ransomware attack that locks the system. And you know, the ransomware attacks are up quite a bit to targeting companies. And sometimes it's just send us $5,000 and we'll give you access back to your computer. Or you know, if it's a larger company, obviously it's much more complicated, but um, it could be something as small as, as $75,000, which is not a small sum for, for anyone. Um, but you're probably likely to pay that over the exorbitant recovery costs that might be associated with recovering your system. So um, education is important. Um, I know some larger companies have this system where they actually send test emails and try to trick people into clicking on these links and these and codes. And then they send them an email that says, you got tricked, you shouldn't have clicked on that. And this is why you shouldn't have clicked on that. Um, it's kind of a comp it's a larger company. So I don't know that we all have the resources to put together that kind of a training policy, but you can put together a training policy that just says, well, this is an example of what you're looking for and this is what to avoid and try to do it kind of routinely or regularly, you know, a couple times a year because people forget. Um, but the more you hear it and the more you see it, um, the, the, the easier it is to remember, it becomes more habit than anything. Well, it strikes me it's really easy to send an email out to your entire team and in it, and you know, maybe it's just, you know, a little cybersecurity quiz, which of these, you know, which of these examples which you have clicked on and which ones <laughs> when you have, and just asking them that way. So it'd be a way to alert them to what to look for and then maybe just do, you know, I think somebody can, you know, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs sitting in the room here. I think there may be a security training program coming out here. Somebody may tackle this. <laughs> Another fun way is, um, maybe just use a URL that's just a little off and ask him what's wrong with this URL. Kind of like those um, image puzzles where it does tricks on your eyes. Those kind of things are kind of fun to try to, to figure out sometimes if you can be clever with it. Well, I love that as a, as a great takeaway because what a great way to get your agents thinking about this and have some fun with it, but also, you know, just to help them um, do this. And I know a lot of us hate doing the double authentication where you have to, you know, you got to do the finger, then you got to type in your password to get into stuff, but that prevents a lot, a lot of issues. So final takeaway for today, Miranda. Oh my goodness. Final takeaway. Uh, well, I think the biggest things that we're dealing with today are, again, like I said, data privacy and data security. Um, our world has been really impacted by COVID. Uh, we're all a little bit more isolated and working remotely, but I think Overall, people have adapted really well, um, and I think we'll see more of that remote work, which is going, by extension, going to require um, the, the security protocols. I think keeping yourself informed um, and knowing your vendors, you know, you can offset some of this, li this liability and risk um, by working with vendors. Just ensure that you vet the vendors, know that they're reliable. Um, look at those contracts, make sure that they have the provisions in place that you need. Uh, training is important if, you're, if you've got multiple folks working with you, just make sure that they have that open dialogue. Um, with the wire transfer, you know, you can always reach out to your local authorities ahead of time to establish a relationship with them and say, if I'm a victim of wire fraud, what would you recommend? Um, because those are very time sensitive issues. So you don't wanna be in a situation where you have to figure that out later. Um, and again, their communication is important there. So there's always a lot of news and a lot of information out there. And sometimes it's really hard, hard to fil filter it down. Um, but you, know, you can always feel free to give me a, a call or an email. Um, I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing, training, communication, and, and just be diligent with it. it it's not going to go away anytime soon. We wish it would, but anyway, Miranda, <laughs> thank you. Lots of great tips. And I love the training tip about the emails that, you know, I think that's one everybody can use in any company, which one of these is there issues with you just do that per periodically. Did you know, and you could have some fun with that. And certainly uh, there are plenty of examples out there all the time. And as this evolves, Miranda, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Bernie. I appreciate it.